Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to week 40 of ENM 2020. Um, we're going to continue starting wrapping up, which is to say, I think we're done with our discussions. And now I'm going to do a couple of things that people had asked me to um, a session on publishing your results a session on uh, seeking funding for your work, and a session on kind of an overall ENM workflow, and then of course evaluation. So let's let's go ahead and jump into this um, publishing your results. So I mean this is this is how many people in this field are evaluated. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> students. And academics are evaluated based on their their ability and their record and in, in publication, uh, and probably a lot of other people in the in the NGO world or in the government world, publications certainly certainly don't hurt your record. Um, and another another thing is you know, twenty years into this field, it's um, or this tool set. It's not as easy to publish your work. There are a lot more people who are out there kind of at the level of expert and many of them have strong opinions. So um, I think this is specifically for, for niche modeling and then also more generally for, um, for your work in general in biology. Um, publishing your research is, is a big challenge. So I'm, I'm just going to go through kind of an overall workflow. Uh, it looks like this. And basically what I want to do is, is walk you through the whole set of steps and refer you to a bunch of links that are on the course page uh, that will give you more information about each of these steps. But this is it's a bit complicated and I think you know, first timers or, or beginners or early career people can sometimes get a little lost in this, in this, um, in this process. So here we go. Uh, let's, let's, um, let's walk through this kind of step by step. So let's start with these initial start, uh, set, steps. And this is kind of all stuff that happens um, while we do research. You, know, you come up with a research idea or, or your boss tells you to do a, a particular analysis or, um, or you've always had this curiosity about a particular question. But the research idea comes from somewhere. And obviously you have to go out and find the necessary funding and you have to exe execute the research. Now, somewhere in this early stage, you also need to think about authorship. And I'll just say to you uh, very simply that a lot of friendships in uh, science have ended because of um, uncareful decisions about authorship. So my, my advice to you is that you talk about these things in advance so that everybody knows exactly what to expect in exchange for his or her time, uh, his or her effort and intelligence and, and all that and making the research happen. Don't let there be surprises. It's better not to. Okay, so that's kind of all the early stuff. Then we actually write the paper and uh, there's much more information about how to write the paper in the online videos that I'm going to refer you to. Uh, but suffice it to say that we have to think a little bit at the beginning about either which journal we're going to use, or at the very least, which type of journal we're going to use. Is it an abbreviated kind of news headline format like Science Nature, PNAS, or is it a long format uh, type? type um, journal, like uh, maybe ecology or evolution. Um, but it, you'll just, you'll save yourself some work. 
if you have at least some idea of what kind of journal you're aiming for. Then you're gonna write the manuscript. You're gonna take extreme care in formatting the literature. because a lot of reviewers and editors get pretty grouchy when you send in something that has the wrong format for the literature cited. You're gonna edit your work extremely, extremely carefully, which is to say, you need to figure out how you as a writer can get enough distance from your own writing that you can look at it with a very critical eye. Sometimes that means um, asking a favor of a friend and maybe the friend will ask you the same favor. Sometimes that means, you know, leaving your manuscript for a week after supposedly you've finished it. But I guarantee you, you have errors. And learning how to be your own critical editor is a very important step in this whole process. Another question that is newer is this question of to create a preprint or not, which is to say, via BioArchive, MedArchive, or any one of several preprint archives, you have the option of publishing, but without peer review, an advanced copy of your work, and then converting that to a postprint once it is reviewed and uh, accepted by a journal. They have to make sure that the journal that you're thinking of um, indeed allows this. And you also have to make sure that it's the right solution for you. Uh, Preprints are very good when you're trying to get an idea out there in the literature and perhaps you're worried that somebody else is working on the same idea and you wanna make sure you get credit for it. Um, or when speed of communication is of the essence, like maybe, maybe you have an important paper about COVID-19 or something like that. Um, anyhow, you choose your journal finally now, and that kind of goes with this preprint or not preprint decision. And once you've chosen the journal, we're headed off the, off the page and we're gonna come back here, then you have to prepare the submission. And so now we're talking about writing a cover letter. And some cover letters are very simple. And some cover letter letters are essentially like an abstract or an extended argument for the paper. Um, in many cases, you need to make suggestions about reviewers. And then you have to navigate the submission system for the, for the, the journal. So this is, this is um, full of important steps. Like notice a little farther down this flow, we have this possibility of editorial rejection. Well, that depends in large part on your cover letter and probably some of your editing as well, which is to say no editor, myself included, no editor wants to um, spend the time and effort to review a paper that's poorly edited and is messy and full of errors, or that doesn't have an effective cover letter that makes it tantalizing. Okay, so that's our manuscript submission. Then we have this initial editorial phase. This, it gets complicated here. Your paper arrives to the editor's hands and the editor makes a decision. Basically, are they gonna have the paper reviewed or are they just going to reject it? And in some senses, this is a very kind moment uh, for editors because they're basically saying, I'm pretty sure that your paper doesn't have a chance in my journal. And so rather than take two or three months to do this, I'm just gonna let you know the bad news once and for all. 
Now, some editors are rather petty about it or perhaps have a um, overly high uh, impression of the importance and prestige of their journal. So it's not always kind. But suffice it to say, if the editor decides not to have your paper reviewed for their journal, then your paper cycles back to journal choice and you have to do this cover letter, reviewer suggestions, manuscript submission all over to a new journal and you end up right back here. So you do that until a journal decides to review your paper. Hopefully it won't be too many tries before it happens. And the editor then is going to choose reviewers, send the, the manuscript out to the reviewers, get the reviews back and make a decision. And this is where, you know, there's quite a bit of complexity. It may be that the reviewers say, this is a really terrible piece of work. And this is simply not the right paper for this journal or maybe for any journal. The editor rejects it. And look at that, you're back at journal choice and you go back here and back until you find another editor who is willing to review it. You may have made some, some changes. Maybe the editor gave you some ideas about how to make your, your paper better. And you've also now seen one set of reviews. Okay, in the very best of worlds, the editor just accepts it. And I'm just gonna tell you, it's not very probable that this happens on the first round, but it does happen. If that happens, your paper continues along this over, overall flow, but most likely what happens is the editor and the reviewers point out some problems, point out some gaps, whatever, and they suggest to you some revisions. And this is probably the point at which most beginning authors get into the most trouble. But basically, the editor sends you back your manuscript and says, well, I can't accept it at this time, or I'm rejecting it in its current form. But the real question is, is it a reject that is final? That's called rejecting with prejudice, which is to say, reject and don't send it to me again. Or is it a reject without prejudice, in which case they're rejecting it how you submitted it, but they're not adverse to, to considering it again. So that's a question that's pretty open. Uh, suffice it to say, if you get um, something that's very explicit and says major revisions or minor revisions, or you know, needs some changes before this could be acceptable in the journal, or it could be rejecting but willing to consider a resubmission, something along those lines, then you're on this arrow. So first thing you do is you read the reviews. And usually when you read those reviews, you want to say, oh, those reviewers are stupid. They didn't get what I was saying. They don't know what they're talking about. They, uh, uh, they hate me, they hate my advisor, you know, any number of things. And sometimes those things are true. Most of the time, it's good to read the reviews and then walk away from it for a couple of days and then read the reviews again. And usually what you see is that some or all of the suggestions are meaningful. And so you then put together a strategy and there's a whole video on response to reviews um, on the list that I'm gonna give you all on the course page. Um, but you're gonna do some combination of further analysis and certainly revisions to your manuscript. And you're gonna develop a document which is called response to reviews. You put all that together, along with your revised manuscript, 
and you send it back to the editor. Now, a very dear friend of mine, Rafe Brown, uh, describes this process this way. Imagine that you have a handful of coins and you're going through the reviews and every time that you um, say, yes, done, or you know, changes made or anything of that sort, then you don't lose any coins. But every time that you say, the reviewer doesn't understand what I'm talking about, and really it's this, and my, my wording was fine the way it is, you lose a couple coins. Okay, you're spending that reserve that you had. Well, in the course of your response to reviews, and some responses to reviews are 20 pages long. So hopefully yours will be three or four pages long. But if in the course of your response to reviews, you spend all those coins and you end up with an empty hand, then the editor is going to reject. Okay, but basically, your, your manuscript comes back around to the editor. The editor can decide based on your response to reviews and the changes you made, the editor can decide to reject right then and there, or they can decide to send it out for more, re more review, or they can decide to jump these steps and just accept it. That's relatively rare. Suffice it to say that you can go through this loop several times. My feeling as an editor and as an author is that it's not fair of an editor to ask for more than two rounds of revision without coming to a final decision, which is to say, reject or accept. Not all editors agree with me. Um, I'm currently a co-author on a manuscript I think it's a really cool manuscript, but it has been through four rounds of revisions, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be sent, sent back out to the reviewers again. Anyhow, so you, you don't want to let this process go on forever, but you also need to be patient with it. So, you know, don't pull the beginning author error of saying, but Mr. Editor, Dr. Editor, but Dr. Editor, um, I need this paper accepted by next week. And most likely the editor is just going to say, okay, I'll reject it then. But let's imagine you get through this process and eventually your work is accepted. Now we're down here. Um, the journal, but now as a publisher, receives the final manuscript with all the final edits and such. And they do what used to be called typesetting, but it's now a, an electronic process. They produce a preliminary version of your manuscript, which are called proofs or galley proofs. And those are sent back to the reviewer, uh, sorry, back to the researcher. And the researcher basically has one last chance to make sure that the that the uh, paper looks like they want it to look like. And basically, if you send back the proofs and there's still some remaining error, it's your problem. Um, reading and correcting your proofs is important and you need to do it with each paper. You're allowed to make minor changes to your paper, but they really have to be minor. And some journals will even threaten to charge you per correction if they weren't things that were factual errors um, or you know, just they, if they are anything other than minor, uh, the editor is not going to be very happy with you. Anyhow, you have a few days in which to do this, this correction of the proofs and making the minor changes. You return it to the journal. Sometimes, many times these days, the journal publishes your paper as an early view, basically a, an accepted papers. And then a few days, weeks, months later, depending on the journal, uh, you get the final publication step. 
So, bravo, you're now through with the whole process. There are only a couple things more that I'd, I'd bring up with you. Um, one is that nowadays it's reasonable and socially acceptable to uh, diffuse your paper out, which is to say it is not uh, it's not considered impolite to, you know, tweet or post on Facebook or anything like that when you produce a paper and you want to share it with people. Uh, the other thing, and we'll talk about this, I guess this coming week, I forgot about this, but um, is that of opening access to your paper. Essentially, many journals are by subscription only. And so the only people who can read your paper are people who are at an institution that's able to pay that subscription. And so we'll talk about this next week, but uh, open access is a crucial, important topic. It's one that uh, I've put a lot of time into over the years. Um, and so it, it probably deserves its own, its own lecture. Okay, well, that's the whole process. Um, you know, in your own case, things may be a little different, right? I mean, maybe your institution has the funding or uh, the authorship is set in advance, or, you know, maybe the, the editor decides um, to jump from getting your response to reviews directly to accept which is to say there are lots of variants on this, but this is the basic process. And I think it's useful to, to see the whole process before you jump in and try to, to try to navigate it yourself if you're a beginner. So I hope this has been helpful. And again, please see the course page for ENM 2020. And there's a whole string of videos that I created a couple years ago that I think will be helpful to you with, with kind of more detail on several of these topics that I've talked about just now.